So she kicks off, his numbers look bad. It would cost you money. Yeah, and keep a life-saving protocol off the market. One person should never endanger thousands. Well, thank God you were here to save all those lives. As much as I think Bogle is trying to make useful points here, that doesn't seem to be driving his motivation. He wants to protect his profit and undermine House's authority here by making him seem negligent. Very excited to be reacting to House MD Season 1, Episode 18. Let's see if I can get the diagnosis before House does as a doctor working in London. On this channel, we are reacting to all 177 House episodes, and this would be Episode 44. No time to waste. You know, when the baby comes, I am going to be... This is the first actively pregnant patient that's been the focus of a case. That's particularly interesting as pregnant women have some physiological differences compared to their non-pregnant counterparts. Increased intra-abdominal pressure that can lead to hyperventilation. Increased cardiac output to provide blood flow to the placenta. Reduce systemic vascular resistance, reduce blood pressure, increase plasma and red cell volume causing peripheral edema and relative anemia, hypercoagulability which can lead to clots being more likely to form. So it seems like our patient was suffering from disordered neuroactivity, mimicking a seizure as she appeared blank. In pregnancy, eclampsia would be the first thing to rule out, which is a severe complication of pre eclampsia where the placenta leads to a hypertensive disorder possibly through spasm of the small arteries as a result of reduced placental blood flow risk factors for this include lupus kidney disease pre-existing hypertension and diabetes first things to do would be check blood pressure do a neurological exam blood test for kidney function, check the urine for protein, and if it is eclampsia, the only cure is actually delivering the baby and more importantly, the placenta. It seems like she's the end of second trimester, so survival rates for the fetus would be between 60 and 70%, even though 24 weeks is actually the threshold for abortion in many countries, so you can see why it's such a heated topic of debate. Your liver and kidneys aren't working so well. Preeclampsia is a possibility. I've miscarried three times. I'm 39. Guess what increases the likelihood of eclampsia, can cause recurrent miscarriages, and affects females around her age? Lupus. Foreman opened this discussion by saying the good news is thankfully it's not a stroke. That is good considering that she had none of the symptoms of an acute stroke. Remember them using the acronym FAST. So F is for facial asymmetry, A is for arm weakness on one side, S slurred speech, and T is for time, which is essential in a stroke, since if we can treat within four and a half hours of symptom onset, then the chances we can reverse any neurological deficit become much higher. What else could it be here though? I feel like this case is one of those multi-stage questions that you get asked where you need to crack the first part to be able to answer the second. So what else can cause a recurrent miscarriage that could fit this case? So hormonal disorders like polycystic ovary syndrome, hypo or hyperthyroidism, diabetes, antiphospholipid syndrome which causes a predisposition to clotting and is associated with lupus could do it as well. Other autoimmune conditions like vasculitis could do it, listeriosis or pelvic inflammatory disease could do it. We also know she had IVF so there is a higher likelihood that there could be a multiple pregnancy which is also a risk factor for preeclampsia in themselves, but she should have had her dating scan at 11 weeks, an anomaly scan at 20 weeks already, so we would know about that. Also, risk of miscarriage at this point is unlikely as 80% happen in the first trimester. Definitely need some more clues. Any house? <laughs> Look for a shallow grave with Volga standing over it. You have a stage four cancer been so good to me. But just in case, I special ordered an extra jumbo sized coffin. Hey! <laughs> they got me for a moment there. I'm more likely to end up in that jumbo sized coffin than Vogler to say House has been good to him. This is one of the great things in House. They explore serious concepts without taking themselves too seriously while not detracting from the importance of what they're actually discussing. It's a very tight line to walk on, kind of like 
Doing a tightrope walk between two skyscrapers, veer off too much to the factual side and it becomes too heavy and tough to digest like an all-you-can-eat buffet. Too much to the fun side and you risk losing credibility and not providing enough value. House treads that middle line perfectly and that is part of what makes it such a legendary show. Now, what is Vogler actually going to do to him after that speech in the last episode? 39-year-old female, altered mental status and complete loss of coordination. Pregnancy-related autoimmunity. Okay, a lot to go through here. We've just had confirmation that she is 28 weeks pregnant. She's got a negative tox screen for alcohol and drugs. Some pregnant people don't, believe it or not. She was also on a medication called oxybutynin for incontinence. They took her off that and there was no change. That is curious because that medication isn't advisable in pregnancy as some animal studies have shown it to be toxic to the fetus. What's even more curious is that it's actually used for neurological causes of incontinence. Could that be a sign of nerve involvement? I definitely want to do a full neurological exam to check for signs of demyelination as multiple sclerosis could cause incoordination and bladder symptoms. Another possibility could be motor neuron disease like ALS or Huntington's. They've also said her blood pressure is normal, so it's signaling that it's not preeclampsia. Cameron quit and do an MRA for vasculitis too. There's no way she quit. An ultrasound? Excellent thought. MRA for vasculitis. Hello, big spenders. You see, the reason why I say that is generally there is an order of investigations that is done based on invasiveness, difficulty of tests, and risks. It goes bedside tests first, like fingerprint glucose or ketones, then lab tests like blood or urine, then imaging like CT or MRI, then invasive tests like biopsies or colonoscopies. Now you may be wondering about this whole Cameron thing. The previous episode finished in a very spicy way where Cameron went to House's house and quit to try and take control of multiple decisions. A whether she and House would be together or not, and B, whether she got fired out of the whole team. You see, the thing is, I'm sure Vogler will still be out for blood. I don't think he's gonna be satisfied with just her quitting. Honey? <coughs> well, uh, she's choking. Oh. I, can't, I can't even swallow. This is getting very spicy. When neurological symptoms get so bad, that you can't swallow, that is called bulbar symptoms because swallowing is centrally controlled by the brainstem which looks kind of like a bulb. Whatever this is, it's progressing extremely quickly and definitely in line with a neurological condition. A bit too fast for motor neuron disease which makes me wonder, what if since the wife wasn't having much success with this husband, three miscarriages can hurt a marriage, maybe she could start looking for emotional support elsewhere got syphilis and now it's spreading to her brain, could cause all the symptoms. Another less spicy option could be myasthenia gravis or potentially Lyme disease or still listeriosis. Some reassuring points though is they mentioned the ultrasound looks good and there's no sign of fetal distress, but it's tough to look on the bright side when your brain bulb isn't bulbing. It's pneumonia. She has gone from the 25th weight percentile to the third in one month. Well, there's this diet we put around. Raw food, we're vegans. Raw vegan diet in an infant. That's about as safe as anthrax. That's because a raw vegan diet consists solely of uncooked plant-based foods which lack essential nutrients that are crucial for an infant's growth and development. Infants have high nutrient requirements for proper brain development, bone growth, and overall health. Specific nutrients lacking include vitamin B12, iron, calcium, zinc, vitamin D, and essential fatty acids like omega-3s, which are primarily found in animal-based products. We know that here, since this child has lost weight, that is cause for concern as the fastest phase of growth for any human is in infancy, unless you're Arnold Schwarzenegger. You can see by looking at these growth charts that we categorize all children according to their centile. That is, how does this child weigh compared to all others of their gender and age? We expect that when a child is born on a particular centile, that they'll follow that line through their entire childhood. If they drop two lines, then it's called failure to thrive. Question for you smart people. How quickly 
Do infant lower limb long bones grow per day? Answers down below. If only our ancestors had mastered the secret of fire. Starving babies is bad and illegal in many cultures. I'm having her admitted. This case reminds me of an eight month old boy I saw when I was on the pediatric unit. His mother mentioned that he was a little pale, but when I saw him, he was ghost level pale. The mother had been breastfeeding him solely all the way up to eight months old and I suspected he had anemia. When I took his blood I was shocked as it was so thin it looked like strawberry squash. Normally a hemoglobin level should be more than 135 and his was 20 because breast milk contains all of zero milligrams of iron, which means the body doesn't have the building blocks to produce red cells. That is why you should be introducing solid food to babies by six months to make sure they're keeping up with their strict requirements. This is why effective education is so important and antenatal classes to keep parents informed should be mandatory for everyone. Don't see any signs of vasculitis. Naomi, you okay? I'm getting cramps. It feels like my miscarriage is. Preterm labor. Flu's and tibutaline then. Some medicine, okay? Try to stop your labor. Ooh, preterm labor at 28 weeks. That is scary. Those contractions could be the uterus starting to try and push the fetus out too early. Now at this point, you want to stop the contractions and they're using magnesium, presumably magnesium sulfate, which relaxes the smooth muscle of the uterus. Tibutaline is a beta agonist that relaxes smooth muscle by stimulating adrenergic receptors. These will buy pregnant women a maximum of 48 hours. So at this point with a premature 28 week of baby, you really want to give steroids to help the baby's lungs to mature, giving them the best chance for when they eventually do come. This may not be premature labor though. Maybe it's abdominal muscle spasm from upper motor neuron disease. Also, why do symptoms always happen during the MRI scans. No wonder patients are so scared of them. Watching a medical drama, you'd wonder if it's a scan machine or the Grim Reaper's shed. Boom! Ha! So I've got Cameron. Yeah, I expect you in my office with your letter of resignation and plans for public apology. Letter of resignation. Letter of resignation. No wonder House has been hiding in the clinic for the whole episode. He looks like he's about to get 25 lashes and sent to the gallows. Now what Vogler is dealing with here is a pharma PR nightmare as House just trashed his pharmaceutical company's new drug on the podium. There is an entire industry in real life to deal with incidents like this called pharma communicators. Despite that, some crises are way too large to sweep under the rug, like Purdue Pharma in 2019, who aggressively marketed their new drug, OxyContin, as being less addictive and more beneficial for chronic pain, despite that being totally untrue. This fueled an opioid crisis in the US and the company had to be dissolved, despite misleading doctors with false evidence and the general public, the Sackler family who owned the Purdue Pharma didn't go to prison because of a deal that was agreed with the Attorney General where they paid $6 billion in damages. Sackler family voices regret but deny wrongdoings. Does someone who's had no wrongdoing just hand over $6 billion? I'll let you decide. She choked on soft, wet pear. That's way past muscle weakness. Did you do an upper endoscopy? Okay, so House is confused because she choked on food that is soft, which should be easy to swallow, which indicates an obstruction. So he wants to do an endoscopy, which is putting a camera down into the esophagus or the food pipe. Endoscopy procedures do have a small risk of actually causing a hole in the food pipe, which is not really ideal. That's why you'd want to do an imaging test first, like a barium swallow, to see what's going on. Now, with nerve damage to the esophagus, there is a condition called achalasia, which causes a bird's beak appearance on barium swallow. In that condition, it's actually easier to swallow more solid things than liquid, as they help to push their way through the stomach sphincter. So House saying there's an obstruction because she struggled with swallowing a pear, isn't quite right. The other thing is choking and a food bolus where the food just gets stuck in the food pipe are also 
two different things. How suspects an obstruction in the food pipe, but generally that wouldn't cause choking and coughing as that only really happens when the muscles of swallowing are weak and leads to aspiration, which can be very dangerous. I experienced that firsthand once when I was in hospital. One of my patients was an 88 year old female that was just recovering from a stroke and her swallow had just gone good enough for her to have some water. One day she asked for some water and the nurse poured her a glass for her and she drank it and started frothing at the mouth. It turned out that it wasn't water and was actually bleach as the cleaners had been mixing bleach with the water jugs and left it on the patient's bedside table. The aspiration pneumonia the patient got was unfortunately terminal and the nurse and cleaner were suspended. You can never be too careful. And check your eyelids. Now with this eyelid association, could House be talking about the freckles seen in Pugh's Jaeger's syndrome? It causes gastrointestinal polyps called hamatomas and pigmentation on the lips and the eyelids. The polyps are usually in the small intestine though, so it doesn't quite fit here. Wonder what house is scheming. Never have I been so curious to see someone's eyelids. The house effect. She's doing better. Oh, thank God. Technically, Alexander Fleming. He developed antibiotics. Rachel and Joel Kaplan? Say You're being charged with child endangerment. Starving your kid. Wow, wow, wow. So those parents are two french fries short of a happy meal. I'll give them that but they are not abusive. The threshold for social services taking responsibility for a family's baby is surprisingly pretty high. The reason why it may seem fairly straightforward, but you'd be surprised what people think. Children do better when they stay with their parents. So the abuse has to be fairly significant for this to happen. Living through foster care can be incredibly difficult finding a home, adjusting to a new family, the stress of losing your parents can all cause significant psychological distress to children. One thing though is the younger the child, when they are moved, the less distressed they actually are. Since this is pretty much a six month old baby, they probably would barely notice, but a six year old's child development would reverse significantly if you move them to a new home. One is drooping a little bit. This swelling. She has a three centimeter mass in her right upper lobe. Oh, very spicy. So the obvious answer is that this tumor is a small cell lung cancer causing a paraneoplastic syndrome called Lambert Eaton Myasthenic Syndrome. But I'm sure that's what they want me to think. Regardless, it's an interesting diagnosis, so let's talk about it. Basically, this specific type of lung cancer triggers antibodies to your body's own neuromuscular junctions, which are the interfaces between your nerves and your muscles. This interferes with the calcium channels, which are very important in muscle contraction, leading to fatigable contractions, weakness, difficulty swallowing, and many, many more. The treatment would be to remove the underlying cancer and neutralize the antibodies. But this could also be something like a granuloma indicating tuberculosis, sarcoidosis, or a cavity causing aspergillosis. It could also be a benign lesion that is distracting from the real problem elsewhere. One interesting thing to consider is that the diagnoses here that they're pointing towards seem to be autoimmune, but autoimmune conditions actually improve with pregnancy. So it'd be unusual to present like this. Although it seems like unusual is the only thing on the menu. Imagine if it was such a common diagnosis that everyone overlooked, like vitamin B12 deficiency. That would be a very funny curveball. It's small cell lung cancer. Some cancer patients get what are called paraneoplastic syndromes. That's called Lambert Eaton syndrome. You'll need a C-section before you can start the treatment. Oh, okay. Glad I got that right, but the celebrations cut short that she's had three miscarriages fourth pregnancy, 28 weeks into the pregnancy, and she knows the odds aren't good. So is she really going to let them do a C-section so that she can have chemo? That would be a very tough call and a difficult situation. You see, small cell lung cancer is the most aggressive lung cancer with a median survival from diagnosis of 15 months. And on the 
8% survive past five years. Now I know House's team are allergic to biopsies, but what you should do before talking about taking the baby out is actually confirm it's cancer. Since right now they could have even just mixed up her x-ray with someone else's, it's happened before. So other than what I mentioned before, it could also be pulmonary carcinoid tumors, lymphoma, or even lung abscesses. Stick a needle in it before you stick your foot in it. I'm not doing the radiation. A few more weeks will save the baby. Oof, I don't envy anyone who gets put in this position. Cancer can be such a horrible condition. I don't speak about this much, but one of my colleagues on cardiothoracic surgery was diagnosed with pancreatic cancer while I was working with him. He's one of the kindest guys, 50 years old, always used to bring in food to work and support people in difficulty. He's very positive on diagnosis, but unfortunately, just six months after he found out, he had passed away. It reminds me of what Oliver Berkman's international bestseller book, 4,000 Weeks, says where he mentions that the average human lifespan is exactly that, 4,000 weeks. It's short and he asks some very interesting things as part of his five questions. How would you spend your days differently if you didn't care about seeing your actions come to fruition? In what ways have you yet to accept that you are who you are and not who you ought to be? It was quite a deep dive into figuring out how to manage my time. And if you're interested in learning more, you can access the audiobook with a free trial of Audible Premium Plus by pressing the link in the description. Even by signing up to the free trial, you are supporting the channel as I do get a small kickback from that. Thank you in advance. Gregory House recently gave a speech about me. He violated a DNR. He brought a termite into the OR and spat on a surgeon. He accepted a Corvette from a patient who was a known member of the New Jersey Mafia. Quite an impressive resume House has got there. At least when he gets fired, he knows he'll walk straight into a job in a meth lab. In all fairness, this is exactly why context and nuance are very important. He brought a termite into the OR and spat, although he didn't spit. It was more of a voluntary hybrid cough sneeze. On a surgeon sounds very different when you follow it with to stop a surgeon incorrectly cutting out a patient's liver because they have the wrong diagnosis. This is part of the reason why I'm glad platforms like TikTok are encouraging longer form content since it's tough to get the whole idea of a topic in a seven second short, unless it's how to accept a gift from the mafia. He's personally had more complaints filed against him than any department in this hospital. Okay, he's screwed up, but it works for him. He saved hundreds of lives. They're arguing here about whether house is good or bad for the hospital, but that's not the point. The point is that House hit Vogler where it hurts, in his pocket. That was by making a speech basically calling him and his pharmaceutical company a scam. Vogler wants revenge. In the real world, Big Pharma generally has a bad rep and we know that there can be some bad eggs. But what does creating a new medication actually involve? First, you need a therapeutic drug target, an important protein to inhibit or a receptor to stimulate that's part of a disease process. Keep in mind, all easy drug targets have been screened already, so you have to sift through hundreds or even thousands of compounds to find the right one. Then it needs to work in a lab and also on a person. And a good example of the importance of that is Semagakista, an experimental drug that was designed to stop Alzheimer's disease by blocking the formation of beta amyloid plaques in the brain. But when put to the test in phase three clinical trials, it not only failed to show any cognitive improvement, but also led to increased adverse events and worsened cognitive function. Not ideal for a drug that's made to help Alzheimer's disease. Let's say you get past that phase, your patent lasts 20 years and the clock starts before the clinical trial. So you've likely lost half that time before you even go to market. But not only that, you also need to be able to mass produce the drug in a lab, ideally using synthetic processes rather than semi-synthetic or natural processes. That's because synthetic processes allow manufacturing to be scalable, quality controlled, 
cost-effective and safe. To show you an example of where that's difficult, there is a chemotherapy agent called Erbulin, which is effective in treating metastatic breast cancer. It's a synthetic analog of halichondrin B, a natural product that's originally isolated from marine sponges. The complex structure and challenging synthesis of halichondrin B make it impractical to produce synthetically. It instead needs to be produced by modifying a natural product called hemiastelin, also derived from marine sponges. Since it has such a complex manufacturing process, just one dose of erbulin costs a whopping $2,488. That's part of the reason why pharma has higher profit margins than other industries, since the product production and validation process is so difficult. That being said, there definitely are some profiteering and malicious business tactics involved. The average drug prices in the US are 4.3 times higher than the UK, 4.3 times. Take a look at a high ticket drug like Actimmune, which is interferon gamma 1b. Yeah, it's only used for rare conditions like chronic granulomatous disease or osteopetrosis, but a one year course in the US costs $52,321. Guess how much it costs in the UK? It's almost 10 times cheaper, the equivalent of $6,000. $897. Another example of aggressive pharma strategies is Martin Shkreli in 2020, who jacked up the price of a drug called Daraprim from $13.50 a pill to $750 a pill after being granted exclusivity rights. It treats a rare parasitic disease that affects cancer patients, pregnant women, and AIDS patients. When some pharma companies prioritize profit over patients, that affects a whole scientific community. So let's be careful to separate the scientific process from aggressive business practices because one we need and one we most definitely do not. Let's not throw out the baby with the bathwater. He is a drug addict who flaunts his addiction and refuses to get treatment. He is a disgrace and an embarrassment to this hospital. House goes or I go. And by I, I mean my hundred million dollars. House goes or I go. I'd pick the Toyota any day. Vogler's given them quite an ultimatum here. If he's refusing to budge this much about house, then what other things is he gonna force them to do? With Vogler at the helm, even from a business and organizational perspective, leading the company in this kind of patriarchal, non-collaborative way is a surefire way to have unsatisfied employees, a lack of agility, and resistance to change implementation. There is a book called Good to Great, why some companies make the leap and others do not. Much of the answer to that is about collaborative flat hierarchy methods of leadership that listens to its people's ideas and feedback. That is an organizational culture that lets companies thrive for decades. Can you imagine the culture that Vogler would create? That I'd want to cancel. Take your $100 million already. Wooden spoons taste like truffle when we've got some house to watch. I hereby move to revoke the tenure of Dr. Gregory House and terminate his employment at this hospital effective immediately. All in favor? Dr. Wilson. Opposed? Did Cuddy just turn on house? I'm gonna need a therapist after this one. In all fairness, peer pressure, scientifically known as social conformity, is one of the strongest psychological motivators. You can see its power in the famous brain experiment that was caught on camera. An unknowing participant walks into a waiting room, hears a beep, and causes everyone to stand up. It takes just three beeps of seeing it happen for her to give in and start standing up too. Even with having no idea what the reason is, our brains crave conformity and synchronicity. It takes much more will to go against the pack as we intuitively know that there is power in numbers, but sometimes that is the right option. Well done, Wilson, for standing up in what you believe in. I will wave a small flag for you at your funeral. Dr. Wilson, would you mind leaving the room, please? You can't void my vote by making me stand in the hallway. This vote is whether to dismiss Dr. James Wilson. This 
It's getting spicy. I love house episode names because they're always so intelligently crafted. From the old saying, don't throw the baby out with the bathwater, that I sneakily snuck in earlier. Seems like Wilson is the baby and House is the bathwater on this one. They've even made sure that Wilson has the right hairless baby face to fit. Although Cuddy could probably live with herself acting House, but Wilson as well? Surely that would be a step too far, but a very interesting episode too far. I'm enjoying this. You guys bust out? <clears throat> we made bail. They won't let us in our baby's room. We fed her whenever she was hungry. The nutritionist said it had everything she needed. Foreman, I need a CT scan. Look for abscesses or occult infections. Interesting. So the second case seems like it's not just a clinic case. Also, I love how House is so casual asking them if they busted out. Like, yeah, been there. Done that. Wouldn't surprise me if he had, to be fair. The other thing is that generally there needs to be more evidence of abuse than a child not gaining weight for parents to be put in the slammer. There are so many things that can cause failure to thrive. Gastrointestinal problems like malabsorption through celiac disease, gastroesophageal reflux disease, chronic diseases like cystic fibrosis, congenital heart defects, hormonal imbalances like hypothyroidism or adrenal insufficiency, recurrent respiratory infections, UTIs, tuberculosis, viral infections like HIV or parasitic infection could do it. The list goes on and on. Before irradiating her with a CT scan and giving a lifetime cancer risk of up to one in a thousand, it's worth ruling out some of those things first with blood tests. Also, now we know that an actual baby and not just a baby-faced oncologist is front and center of this episode. Could this baby have been infected by contaminated bathwater? What if it's Legionella? Oh, now that would be a diagnosis. Test that baby's urine. What are you doing? I got sacked. I voted to keep you. It's your only off the board, right? They couldn't have gotten unanimous approval for you. You'll be gone soon too. Did House make the wrong decision here? On one side, you give a speech allowing the pharmaceutical company to make millions of dollars and rip off a whole population of people. On the other side, your only loyal friend's career. Which do you actually choose? The truth is that as crappy as it looks from Wilson's perspective, House made the right call and he would do it time and time again. It would have been impossible for him to predict that this would happen as a result of his actions. And even if he did, the decision prevented the most suffering, leading to the most positive good in the world. In the thick of it though, it's tough to be that logical, even though success in this world almost relies on being able to park your emotions on the side in times like this that matter to allow yourself to think clearly. It's what Daniel Kahneman talks about in his international bestseller, Thinking Fast and Slow. Type one thinking is reflexive, quick, emotional and assumptive. Type two thinking is more analytical based on facts, more likely to be in line with the truth, but more effortful and difficult to obtain, making it rarer. It's, it's not cancer. Nice job of protecting me. You saved my job by sacking Wilson. You don't spit on the man that signed your paycheck. You are a great doctor, House, but you are not worth a hundred million dollars. Oh, that was colder than an ice bath on the moon. I love a house, but this whole scenario is so far-fetched. Where was the money coming from before Vogler and his inflated check made their grand entrance to Princeton Plainsboro? Had Cuddy been buying Dogecoin with the hospital budget? Also, that is not how you do a rectal exam. There is a curtain, the door is locked, the patient's laying on their left side facing a wall with their knees up to their chest. For intimate examinations, there's generally a chaperone in the room as well to help support the patient get dressed and make them feel comfortable, not putting them down on all fours by the side of the bed and letting someone come in halfway through the conversation as we saw here. Patients always warn me before an intimate exam that they haven't showered or shaved and trust me, it doesn't matter to me. 
All I want to do is rule out any concerning conditions that could be causing your symptoms and we do dozens of rectal exams a week. There won't be anything that I haven't seen before. You sequence the DNA of the tumor cells, P53 gene mutation at codon 55. She's perfect for your trial. When can she start? She can start in two days. Believe it or not, one in a thousand live births involves a mother with cancer. What's even more surprising is that the evidence we have although scanty, shows that it may be safe to have chemotherapy in the second or third trimester of pregnancy. There are just so many variables though of how much of the drug could cross the placenta, maternal physiology, the type of drug itself, and stage in the pregnancy. So a decision is usually made by a multidisciplinary team on whether the benefits outweigh the risks for each individual patient situation. One of the biggest challenges is conducting trials like this on pregnant patients due to the ethical implications if it actually goes wrong. Now, House admitted the fact that the patient was pregnant when getting her into the study. I love House, but I wouldn't want to be his lawyer. I've scheduled a C-section. Angiogenesis inhibitors to prevent the tumors from creating blood vessels. The treatment would be fatal to the baby. Okay, in real life, you can't go ahead and schedule a C-section without consent. You could do an emergency C-section without consent if the patient was in critical condition and didn't have capacity to consent for themselves. Also, there was actually a case series on an angiogenesis inhibitor called Bevacizumab used in pregnancy from 2015 by Polizzi and colleagues. It was directly injected into the eye for wet age-related macular degeneration, which is known to still have systemic effects. 16 patients were assessed in the case series. There were two miscarriages within four weeks after injection, but they were given in the first five weeks of pregnancy. After five weeks, even with multiple administrations of the medication, there were no pregnancy-related complications. So House isn't quite accurate that this would be fatal to the baby, but let's go with it since it does make for good television. No, you don't know what it's like raising a sick child. How long have you been taking oxybutynin? Since I was about 20. Incontinence is pretty uncommon in a woman of your age. That sentence she said seemed to stand out you don't know what it's like raising a sick child. What does that actually mean? Sounds like she had experience with that from when she was younger. And the incontinence could be a few things. Are they trying to make it seem like she was pregnant in the past? That would be the obvious cause, but oxybutynin is really a treatment for urging continence, not stress incontinence caused by pregnancy. So what's the difference? Urging continence, also known as overactive bladder, is when you feel like you need to pee and have to rush to the toilet, but can't get there on time. Chronic causes could be neurological, like in motor neuron disease or MS, bladder obstruction like bladder stones or a narrowing in the urethra, consumption of bladder irritants like spicy food, caffeine, or Many people don't realize, but artificial sweeteners can as well. It can be treated by addressing the underlying cause, doing bladder retraining, pelvic floor exercises, medications like oxybutynin that our patient is on, and in more advanced cases, may need Botox injections into the bladder muscle to help it chill out. Stress incontinence is very different. That's when increased abdominal pressure during things like sneezing or laughing cause a little pee to come out. It's for you guys, I make sure my jokes are so unfunny. The most common cause is pregnancy, but can be caused by aging, nerve damage, from pelvic surgery, or conditions that chronically increase intra-abdominal pressure, like COPD or constipation. The treatment focuses pelvic floor exercises, which you may have heard of as Kegels, and you may be doing right now, which can even be supervised with sensors known as a biofeedback, which can make sure the exercise is done correctly. Sometimes electrical stimulation of the muscles can be done to strengthen them as well. You can even use vaginal cones or weights that need to be held in place by muscle contraction, kind of like a bicep curl, but for the pelvic floor. Medications aren't usually effective and tend to cause more side effects than support. 
Sometimes surgery is needed to support the bladder and urethra by creating things like a sling around the neck of the bladder. So maybe she was pregnant with a child who was unwell and somehow she didn't look after them well enough. Now she feels guilty for that situation, so wants to do right by her second child. Addressing that could be the key to getting her to have the C-section and experimental treatment. This is not your first child, is it? And he doesn't know. I was 18. I got pregnant, got married. I had the most beautiful little girl. She had infantile Alexander's disease. Oh, now that is an exceptionally rare condition, even for house. One in 2.7 million people is a type of leukodystrophy affecting the myelin sheath of the nerves. Part of the reason why it's so rare is that almost all of the cases are from de novo mutations, which means they happen spontaneously and aren't found in either parent. Life expectancy in infantile version is only five to 10 years old, and there's no available cure. So let's find out more. A moving story explains why you're being so selfish. You think that turning yourself into a disposable incubator is gonna protect your baby if die happy. House is that friend we hate to hear the opinion of, but need to. It may seem badass to do this on TV, and it's great to watch, but in real life, this approach just doesn't work. Most people aren't attuned to hearing feedback in this way, and will see it as a personal attack. Josh Kaufman describes this psychological principle in his pretty hefty book, The Personal MBA, as persuasion resistance. So generally, when I'm speaking to my patients, the way I see it is that I'm there to help guide them to the right decision, not force my opinion on them. I once saw a 58 year old female who had high cholesterol, high blood pressure and diabetes. She tried to control her cholesterol with lifestyle changes, but it was still going up. I calculated her cardiovascular risk, which is over the next 10 years, how likely is it she would develop a heart attack or a stroke? And the number was 25% one in four people, that is high risk. I mentioned it was time to look at medication and she stopped and said, absolutely not. I asked her to elaborate and she closed off and wasn't willing to speak about it anymore. After that, I said, look, I won't force you to do anything that you don't wanna do. It's my job to help you make the right decision. And for that, we need to understand all the facts. So she opened up and started telling me about the articles she'd read in the Daily Mail, which said that they weren't safe. I brought her attention to some high quality scientific studies in peer reviewed journals like the 2002 Heart Protection Study published in The Lancet, a pretty well respected medical journal. I mentioned how they followed over 20,000 adults with heart disease and that the medication was proven to reduce risk of stroke, heart attack, and reduce risk of all-cause mortality by 18%. I also mentioned that the risk of myopathy, which she was worried about, was one in 10,000. After seeing that evidence, she made the decision for herself that the statin was the right thing to do to help amplify the impact of her diet and exercise efforts. See, it's very important to make clear that a pill is not a replacement for a healthy lifestyle, and they work together symbiotically like moss and a tree or like education and being a complete idiot on camera. People are entitled to make bad decisions, but by listening, asking the right questions and offering high quality information, we can stop as many of those bad decisions as possible. Okay. Wake her up. That was Vogler. Surgery is off. Vogler has taken this way too far here, and even though this is an extreme example, this Vogler arc is very entertaining. Doctors and managers don't always see eye to eye. A great example of this was when I just entered my palliative medicine rotation of my family medicine training program. They were monitoring prescription errors and they shot up after I joined. The obvious answer was that my prescriptions were the cause, but the audit data the pharmacy was collecting didn't make it clear which doctor was making the errors. About eight weeks into the rotation, I get a visit by one of the departmental managers politely asking me why my prescriptions were so shockingly bad. 
Now, I didn't know any background at this point, so I wasn't quite sure what was going on, as I was pretty sure that I was following the right standard. After that, I did do some digging, and it turns out that just as I had joined, another more senior doctor joined as well to replace a rotor gap. Now, I'm not interested in the blame game because I do think that we are accountable as an organization, but checking the charts, it was their prescriptions that were the culprit. And when I brought this up to the particular manager, not naming any particular names, there was no apology. It touches on the real point of frustration between doctors and managers as NHS Confederation Policy Director Nigel Edwards mentioned in their 2003 article on the topic, doctors and managers have very different priorities. It's not a manager's job to be clinically detail oriented or think of an individual patient or clinician. Doctors worry about patient outcomes. Managers worry about patient experience which includes outcomes, but only as part of a mix to be met out of finite resources. So patients are best served by a tension between the two. Now let's see that tension in action. You're killing her! See, I thought you were the one trying to ram her into a drug trial. She was fully informed. Yeah, well, the guy running the study sure was it? Not his life, not his call. His study, his call. <sighs> This is getting very spicy. As much as I hate to admit it, Vogler does actually have a point about study. There are strict inclusion and exclusion criteria for a reason. If this patient enters the study now after just having major surgery, then develops a clot in the lung while on this experimental treatment, how do we know whether it was the surgery or the drug itself? The success rate of clinical trials and cancer studies is also pretty dismal, just 5% at phase one. And although it increases by phase three, it only goes up to one in three patients who get benefit from the drug. Now this trial is probably phase three, but even if that drug is deemed successful, the threshold for success is that they work better than the current best available treatment. So that might mean increasing the five year survival from 18% to 22%. For so many patients, that just isn't worth the horrendous side effect of chemotherapy. So she kicks off, his numbers look. It would cost you money. Yeah, and keep a life-saving protocol off the market. One person should never endanger thousands. Well, thank God you were here to save all those lives. As much as I think Bogler is trying to make useful points here, that doesn't seem to be driving his motivation. He wants to protect his profit and undermine House's authority here by making him seem negligent. Believe it or not, dealing with difficult colleagues in hospitals who are thinking more of themselves than their patient is quite common. See, when I started my junior placements as a brand new doctor, we used to have these morning meetings where all the medical consultants would be distributing patients that had been admitted overnight. Cardiology, respiratory, gastroenterology, and oncology were all there. Most of the consultants would be sat facing inward into the circle, and there was one consultant gastroenterologist who would sit facing the wall Every time someone tried to give him a patient, he resisted it very strongly. The days he was there, he would get four or five patients instead of the usual 12 that would be allocated. He's a very intelligent person and a skilled gastroenterologist that had even made discoveries, but was definitely not a team player. So navigating those personalities is one of the hardest parts of the job. I hear they're firing the handsome doctor today. So that's dropping down to the ice. There it is. Pulmonary endorse. Gotta get it to a no R. Oh, this poor woman really isn't having a good day. She also has so many risk factors for getting a blood clot. She has cancer, has been immobile for more than three days, and is pregnant. Just pregnancy increases the risk of a blood clot by five times. These are why hospitals risk assess every patient who enters for blood clot risk. And if you've been in a hospital, you probably know those small injections we give to thin the blood called low molecular weight heparin. That can dramatically reduce the risk of a blood clot, but not eliminate it completely. Having had the C-section would have at least helped with the pregnancy part of the risk factors, but recent surgery is a risk in itself. Damned if you do, damned if you don't. Wait, isn't that a house episode title? One thing that isn't quite accurate here is that Chase said he saw the pulmonary embolus when Foreman was doing the ultrasound. 
If you looked on the screen, it was actually the heart showing, and that's for good reason. Can't actually see your pulmonary embolus on ultrasound. You can see the things that may point towards it though, like right heart strain, but that definitely isn't diagnostic. You'd want a nuclear medicine VQ scan in a pregnant woman, but since this is an emergency and they take a while to get, you may opt to do a CTPA, even though it could potentially harm the fetus, or you could decide to treat the embolism blind if you have a reasonable suspicion of what it is. I remember when I first became a doctor, I was called to an 83 year old patient who developed sudden onset breathlessness, kind of like this, and I made a medical emergency call in the middle of the night. The intensive care registrar or resident looked at the patient and said, give him furosemide and dimorphine and then left. I refused to do it as at that point, I actually thought he was trying to end the patient's life actively. But believe it or not, morphine has been used as one of the treatments for flash pulmonary edema, but there isn't much evidence to back that. What was more important was giving the furosemide to offload him. We need to remove the clot and we need you to approve the treatment. Yeah, yeah, of course. The best course for the baby would be an immediate C-section. In her current condition, it's a real chance she won't survive. We need you to make a decision. I just want her to live. This may seem dramatic for him to choose not to have the C-section, but we're faced with tough decisions like this frequently in healthcare. I remember during the pandemic, we had two patients in A&E who were both critically unwell at the same time, but only one intensive care bed. We had to choose which one to escalate and which one to do our best outside of the intensive care unit. House isn't always accurate, but I have to commend them on how they recreate these difficult ethical scenarios in a meaningful way. It works from both a medical and a storytelling perspective. So well done, Universal. We don't have time, we've got to suck it out. BP is dropping. Up the dopamine. She's bleeding into her abdomen. There's nothing we can do, I'm sorry. What? No way! This is why using clot-busting drugs like they did for this embolism can be so dangerous. Not only do they dissolve any clot fragments, but they also cause catastrophic bleeds. Alteplase, which is one of the clot-busting drugs called a tissue plasminogen activator, and in 6.4% of patients, a symptomatic hemorrhage occurs. To try and reduce the risk of that happening, we make sure that we only give it to patients who don't have risk factors for bleeding, like having had recent surgery, being on blood thinners already, or have a hereditary bleeding disorder. I hope that they can save the baby. This episode is rough. Damn Vogler. I need you to locate the C-section. Yeah, that's gonna kill her, right? Probably will. She's dying either way. Okay. Okay. I'm glad he made the right call there as I've seen consequences of when it doesn't happen. When I was on pediatrics, there was a 33 year old mother who was very keen on having a home birth. The midwives advised against it, but agreed to do it with supervision. During the labor, there was delayed progress and the midwives advised going into hospital to get special monitoring to check that the baby was okay, but the mother insisted on continuing at home. Eventually, when the baby's head began to show, it was apparent that the cord was wrapped around her neck. The mother was still refusing to go to hospital until the baby was born about 35 minutes later and wouldn't cry. Eventually, the baby did cry in hospital, but had massively disabling hypoxic brain injury and didn't survive past two years old. A lot of people are frustrated about the medicalization of childbirth and there are many stories of successful home births, but if you're not in the right environment and things go wrong, they really go wrong quickly. He's out, umbilical cords clamped. His lungs aren't opening up. Looks like V-fib, Pulse. How's he doing? He's still not breathing, we've got to intubate. <laughs> he cried! I don't think I could have dealt with two deaths in this episode and seems like the mom isn't gonna make it. Few things to comment on this scene though. Firstly, the ECG when shocking her, they said was ventricular fibrillation, but it looked more like ventricular tachycardia. Academic really, as both rhythms are shockable as long as there's no pulse, but just interesting to point out. The second and slightly more interesting thing was did you notice how they clamped the cord immediately as the baby came out? 
That is actually a pretty bad idea as up to a third of the baby's blood volume at that point is still in the placenta and the umbilical cord. The placenta has a great way of dealing with this by pushing the blood into the baby through a pulsatile motion. If you clamp the cord too early, then you stop this process. So many centers are switching to baby friendly delayed cord clamping to let the babies keep their blood. In preterm babies, it can cause improved circulation, decreased need for transfusion, lower risk of bowel and brain hemorrhages. Definitely ask for this if you're going to have a child. This is Olive Kaplan's CT scan. Does yours send her? I'll call the police and social services and have all the charges withdrawn. You should start Olive on immunoglobulin replacement. That's why she couldn't gain weight. So the hospital managers just put some parents in jail because their son had a syndrome. So much for patient experience. The George syndrome is one of those conditions that examiners love, but I haven't actually seen in real life yet. We remember the signs using the acronym CATCH22, C is for cardiac anomalies, A, abnormal faces, T, thymic aplasia, C, cleft palate, H, hypercalcemia, and the 22 is for the gene that causes the condition, which is a 22Q11 deletion. It's usually treated with antibiotics for infection, calcium supplements, hormone replacement therapy for endocrine problems, surgery for the cleft palate, and anti-seizure medication to limit neurological conditions. House mentioned the treatment would be with immunoglobulin replacement, which you can do to try and limit the amount of infections these patients get as they are immunocompromised, but he was telling Cuddy to do it as if he's already fired. You can't fire House. I'll be stuck reacting to Grey's Anatomy then. <laughs> Please, no. It's the same motion as yesterday, people. I'm voting no. And you're not accountable to anybody either because you think you own us. I move for the immediate dismissal of Dr. Lisa Cuddy. Yes! Not only is she standing up for house, but with the claws out, ready to fight. So it reminds me of that famous Socrates quote as he was sentenced to death by drinking poisonous hemlock because of corrupting the minds of the youth by allowing them to question what they think they believe. The unexamined life is not worth living. Cuddy's spin is, there is no home without house. Usually Cuddy's teeth are pointed toward house, but nice to see that she secretly now, not so secretly, has his back. Now, will someone else step up and protect him? Brilliant episode, 8 out of 10 entertainment, 7 out of 10 accuracy, 6 out of 10 diagnosis. You have a choice. Maybe the last real one you'll have here. Cuddy is a genius. Convincing four people to give up a fortune to save our sorry asses. You voted to get rid of him. The lesser of two evils. What? Vogler is gone. The team are here and Cuddy is a hero. Glad it ended this way because nobody likes a sad ending. That's why there are fewer clinics than massage parlors. This episode was good, but it only makes sense when you watch the previous episode where House actually makes that totally mad speech about Vogler. So watch that here. I'm Sarah Med. Stay curious.